Bezat Hashem, in a few days we're going to be celebrating the holiday of Shavuot. Specifically this year it's going to happen on, the, on Sunday, starting Motzei Shabbat, Shabbat in the evening, going into Sunday. And of course this is in Israel and uh, outside of Israel will be Sunday and Monday. Uh, the holiday of Shavuot is not such a, a, a clear holiday. Let's put it this way. Pesach is pretty clear, big, <laughs> a month and a half of preparation. Everybody knows Pesach, we eat matzah, we went out of Mitzrayim. Same thing with Sukkot. Shavuot kind of seems like, what's the holiday? Eating cheesecake? I mean, well, well, okay, so we got the Torah. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the significance, but more the power of Shavuot. And what can be achieved in this one powerful night because on the night of Shavuot and I, like I told you this year is going to be Saturday night on the night of Shavuot I can open all the gates of heavens the Kabbalistic term will be Sha'arei Shefa the gates of abundance or the Tzinorot Shefa there's pipes that connecting the world above to the world below these spiritual pipes are the channels where the abundance, the energy, the blessing comes from above to below. And on the night of Shavuot, I can open all these gates. And I will explain now for the rest in the next hour what I'm talking about. But we have to understand that when we're focusing on the teachings of Kabbalah, the teachings of Kabbalah explain to us that everything has a root. Nothing just appears here. If something exists in this world, then it's rooted in the world above. So there's no such thing in this world, good or bad, physical or not, that is not rooted somewhere. Okay? With that rule, is that everything has a root, then everything also has a spiritual entity that we call it an ashama, soul. Human beings have it, of course. Animals have it. Also, vegetation and inanimates have a soul. Now, in the body, there's a soul, but it's just the representative of the soul. It's just like an ambassador. There's a root of the soul that is in a world above, and that's the source. So the soul that is in my body right now is, I call it an ambassador. It represents the soul, it's dwelling in the body, but the soul that is in the body pulls down whatever blessing from the root which is in the world above. Okay? And that structure is, applies to everything. Humans, animals, vegetation, inanimates, and so forth. The, in, with humans is a little bit different because there's much more communication between the soul. But the major point that we need to take that everything is rooted in the world above and the soul that's in the world below is the one who pulls down the blessing, the abundance, the shefa, and so forth. Now, the word that I used uh, to uh, explain is called Tsino. Tsino, the translation is a pipe. And what connects us to the world above is these spiritual pipes. And you can call it a channel. The word that is used in Hebrew is Tsino. And there's a reason why it's called Tsino. Because if you take the word Tsino and you write it in Hebrew, and you switch the order of the letters, you get a word that is called Ratzon. Ratzon means a desire. I want, I want to do something. Why is that so important? That when my uh, desire, my, would I want something, is aligned, uh, 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 aligned the right way, then the tzino acts in the right way. Okay, I'll say it again. If my desire, or my will, or my uh, wishes, or my plans are aligned the right way, meaning that my desire right now is to do good, to learn Torah, to help, to inspire, to teach, to... It's aligned well. If I'm now going to make money and my desire is to do charity with, with it and to support my family and to live an, an honest life, then it's aligned way. well. 
But if I'm going now to make money because I want to have a nicer car or to buy myself something that is not so important, it's not aligned well. So what's going to happen now? The sino, the pipe, that where the chef, the abundance, the blessing comes down, is not going to work well. I need to know how to align my desire. So tzino and ratzon is the same letters. I need to make them work parallel. So to understand before we move to the next step, everything has a root in the world above. Everything. Anything that comes up to your mind right now. You'll say now, avocado. The physical avocado in the world has a root in the world above. Whatever it will do in this world, that's what it does in the world above. So water in this world is rooted in the world above. There's water in the world above. To a point that our sages explain that when it's raining in this world, water coming from above to below, there's a shefa poured in the world above. There's spiritual rain in the world above. That's why it's raining right now here. Hot, cold, anything that happens in this world, it originates, it's rooted in the world above, and then it just comes into this world. With that said, now we now go to the next step. Everything comes to the world from the world above to the world below through a certain pipe, a tzino, and uh, many will call it a channel. I, for now, for this ex uh, uh, class, we will call it a tzino, a pipe. And when my needs and my desire and my uh, plans and my actions are not aligned well, then the tzino won't serve me well. With that said, I can explain a little bit what's going on in the night of Shavuot. Now, when a person is born, these pipes are already set and going to serve the person for the rest of his life. These tzinohot shefa. Now again, you can imagine it uh, in pipes. I once gave an analogy of an optic cable. Because the Zohar says that our soul is connected to the world above through 613 tzinohot pipes. And once I gave an example of an optic cable. One pipe and the inside has a lot of uh, little channels in there. So the channels, these pipes that I get to connect me to the world above are already set from the day I'm born. Can't change them. That's how it is. Saying in other words, if you remember the famous quote that when a person is born, it says, Hakol bidei shamayim chutz mirat shamayim. Everything is already decided in the heavens. How you're going to look, who you're going to marry, where you're going to live, you're going to be rich, you're going to be poor, you're going to be smart. Everything is decided before you are born. The only thing that is not decided is your yirat shamayim. You make a decision. Hashem tells you, I'll give you a hammer. You'll decide if you're building something with it or if you're destroying. Hashem says, I'll give you tools. I can give you a knife now. And with the knife, you can carve something beautiful or do an operation and save somebody's life. Or you can take the knife and slaughter somebody. You chose what you want to do. I can give you now money. You can buy junk with it or you can do charitable work with it. So these tools are these pipes that Hashem gives us and it's set from the day we were born. We can't change that. The only thing that is not set, if the pipe, the valve in the pipe will be open or closed. So a person can have a certain pipe and by the way, every blessing will come through a different pipe. Your sustenance comes from one pipe. Your health, another pipe. Your happiness, a different pipe. Everything comes from different pipes. Now, I'm, I'm, that's how I'm imagining. There's a pipe and there's a valve. The pipe, the tzino that you are assigned to when you were born, you can't change it. That's what you get. You don't have blue eyes in the first 10 years of the life and then they become brown for another two years, 10 years and then they become green. If you're born with blue eyes, you have blue eyes. Okay, maybe there's one out of a few billion that the eyes change from when they're a little kid. But you were born a certain way, that's what you get. Same thing here. Whatever is assigned to you, you can't change. The only thing that is not decided is if the pipe will be opened or closed. If chas v'shalom, the pipe is blocked or closed, nothing is going to work. That's it. That's a very simple explanation. Some people, if their parnasa, their livelihood pipe is blocked, 
doesn't matter what they're going to do, they're not going to make money. They'll have the best ideas in the world. Wake up four o'clock in the morning, nothing, it's not going to work. Same thing with meeting the other half, same thing with health, same thing with anything. If the pipe is blocked, no connection to the world above. And whatever you're going to try to do will not going to work. Now, how do you clog, so to say, a pipe? With uh, action that is uh, done with, from coming from the side of Gvura. Gvura means judgment, strictness, severity, stopping, pulling back. How do you open a pipe? With an action coming from chesed. Giving, loving, and so forth. Now, I can do a certain act that is considered gvura. I can steal, I can lie, I can cheat. I can do a certain action and it closes the pipe. That's the action. It's kind of equivalent to any plumbing system. If you push a lot of junk into the sewage, it will block it at some point. Then there's going to be a blockage. Bad odors come up, the water come up, you have to call the plumber and open it. Same idea. But, in many of the cases, the, the pipe can be closed and there's not going to be any, not, you're not going to see any blessing in anything. But, if the pipe is open and you still don't see a blessing, then there's something going on here. That's kind of what I talked about in the class before. That sometimes the pipe is open, but there's no blessing. What's, how? how? A lot of money comes in, and it go, there's no blessing in the money. It goes out right away. You make a lot of money, uh, but here the, uh, the heater exploded. Here the roof collapsed. A dentist now, 5,000 shekels for a root canal. Here money goes. A ticket from a, 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 a parking. Money doesn't... Stay. Saying, in other words, the pipe is open, but there's no blessing. Okay, now I'm just kind of giving some uh, idea of what we're going to talk about. Now, I have to understand that everything that Hashem gives me from above is for only for one thing. For me to complete my tikkun, my rectification in this world. I came into this world with a purpose. Hashem is giving me all the tools and the means only for that purpose. Only to do my tikkun. Now I need to be very focused all my life that I'm doing my tikkun. Tikkun, the, tra the translation of tikkun is rectification. I came into this world, we're learning about it in Shari Gilgulim, we're learning about it in Shari Gdusha, we're learning about it in Tomer Dvora, we have many books that we're learning now simultaneously side, to side, side by side. As I have to come here to do a tikkun. Now, Hashem is so kind that He gives me all the options, whatever I need to do, Tikkun. So, anything that Hashem gives me, it's for my benefit to do a rectification in my life for my soul. Now, if I get the tools, if Hashem gives me money, it's for my Tikkun. If Hashem doesn't give me money, it's my, for my Tikkun. Hashem puts me in this city and then in this city. Hashem makes me a lawyer, an accountant, a doctor. It doesn't matter. Whatever Hashem gives me, use it for your tikkun. Now, sometimes what's going to happen, Hashem will give you kelim, tools, or vessels, and I do the wrong actions with it. Now what's going to be the result? The plumbing, the pipes that I'm talking about, they get blocked. So if Hashem tells me, I'm going to give you money, because your tikkun is to be charitable, and to donate, and to do this, and to do that, and you're using it for nonsense, you're blocking the pipe. If I, Hashem tells, uh, tells you, I gave you wisdom so you can teach and inspire and educate and you're going with that wisdom to trick people in business or whatever, you're blocking the pipe. You're not using what I gave you the right way. Now the term in Kabbalah, it's called kelim. Really kelim is vessels. But you can take the word kli and to translate in Hebrew to a tool. Hashem gives you a bunch of tools. Now, if you're missing one tool, you can't do what you need to. Imagine a carpenter that wants to build a beautiful, a beautiful ark to the Torah. Then he needs the wood, he needs the chisel, he needs the screwdriver, he needs the, the, the hammer, he needs all these tools. Without missing some of the tools, he can complete the task. The tools can be used to do something positive, and the exact same tools can be used to do something negative. 
They don't need to give examples. Any tool you can use for something positive or negative. Same thing with the car, can be used for something positive or negative. The internet can be used for positive and to negative. Now the problem is that Hashem gives me a lot of tools in my life. Every person gets their tools. You are smart, you are artistic, you are uh, a creative. Every person, if Hashem made you uh, creative in your art, it's for you to do your tikkun. It's not your hobby. If Hashem made you a poet, Hashem made you smart, doesn't matter. You need to know what, what are my tools. Now you need to know how to use the tools the right way. If you misuse the tools, then you're going to start blocking all these, you know what, all these pipes. Now what happens is that we all block our pipes. We're human, we lie, we cheat, we, we, we do things that are not appropriate. Then again, not because you're bad, because sometimes you just don't know or you do or whatever. And I'm not looking to blame anybody for their wrongdoings, but that were, that's the fact. Now, what happens is when I do an uh, act that is inappropriate or negative or against the Torah, then I will block the pipe, and like I told you before, this will come from the side of Gvura. Gvura is severity and judgments. When you drive 200 kilometers an hour on a highway, they don't give you a prize if the po policeman stops you. He don't give you a bouquet of flowers and, and chocolates. He gives you a ticket. Same idea. That's like clogging the, the, the pipe. It's judgments. It's an uh, 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 act of gvura. Now, you can get rid of the gvurot, by the way. If I, do, if I lie, if I cheat, I slander, I do something, I arouse dinim. This is called dinim, judgments. Now, you can't get rid of the judgments. There's no such thing. Because if there's a lawsuit, you can't cancel the lawsuit. You can win the case, but you can't cancel the lawsuit. And again, I'm talking about physical terms, but apply the same thing in the spiritual term. Now, how do I go about it? Is I can not get rid of the judgment, but I can sweeten the judgment. And the same thing, I can go to court, and instead of chas I'm going to jail for five years, I'll pay a fine, a ridiculous fine. This is called mituk dinim, sweetening judgments. One of the ways how we do it that is more common to people, and most people don't even know that that's what they're doing. When we're doing Kiddush on Shabbat, we're taking the red wine, and it has to be red wine, even though Lalacha you can do Kiddush on white wine, but we specifically take red wine, because the red represents the, the judgments. We add a little bit of water, and then we do Kiddush on it. We take something, so to say, coming from a negative side, but we're doing a positive act with it, and we're sweetening judgments. And this is one act out of many. But what we want to do is constantly to sweeten the judgments. Now, there are specific times when we can do that. Of course, you can do it at any given moment, but it's extremely hard. It's almost like doing tshuva. You can do tshuva whenever you want. On Yom Kippur, it's easy to do tshuva. Because that's Yom Kippur. That's the day of repentance. Rosh Chodesh, it's easier to do tshuva. Shabbat. But you can do tshuva any day you want. But it doesn't mean that it's so easy. I like uh, uh, calling this concept is sales. I told you already, I lived in America for, uh, for, for, for almost 20 years. And I noticed that every time there's a holiday, there's a sale. Uh, President's Day, 20% off. Veterans Day, 30% off. Independence Day, shop all you can, whatever. And I was always, why are they giving sales on President's Day? Give me a sale on uh, October 23rd. No, it's a holiday, it's an auspicious time, we're giving you a sale. The same system, that's what Hashem does. He says, you, 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 there's going to be auspicious times when I'm going to give you an easy way to sweeten the judgments. The most uh, uh, auspicious time to do that is in three times in the year, which is called the three festivals. Shalosh Regalim, Sukkot, Pesach, and Shavuot. Why? Because that's what Hashem decided. That's my President's or Veterans Day. Sukkot, Pesach, and Shavuot. Just remember that on that day, the act of Hamtakat Atinim can be done like that. Versus during the week or any time of the year will be very, very hard. Now, how does the system work? How do you make a din, a judgment, disappear completely? So I'll give you an example. If a person is hungry right now, Okay? 
he feels a lack. If you're hungry, you feel I'm lacking food. I'm weak. I'm hungry. That's called Midat Adin, judgment. I feel a, a, an absence of something. If you are not hungry, I'm, f I'm fine. You good? You want to eat? No, I'm good. If I'm starving, I feel that I'm missing something. Okay? In Kabbalah, it's called Midat Adin. How do I get rid of this feeling of absence, of hunger, that I need to eat? What is the eating here? If I eat, I become full right now. Now, what's the action that I did here right now? What happened to the hunger? I put food in my mouth, and now I'm not hungry anymore. All right? The hunger disappeared. Saying, in other words, that instead of uh, absence, now I have pleasure. An hour ago, I was starving. I felt absence. I felt uh, emptiness. Then I go and eat. Not only that I enjoy the food and I have pleasure, now I'm uh, satisfied. So in a place of chisaron, of absence, what will fill it is pleasure, ta'anug. Saying, in other words, that the hunger becomes the vessel to pleasure. The absence, the lack of not having food, the hunger is really the vessel to hold pleasure. So every pleasure I have in this world comes from a place of lacking something or a place of absence or a chisaron, something that I don't have. Okay? That's the system how it works with sweetening a judgment. I am lacking something, then I put a, something instead and then it turns into a shefa, into a, an abundance and pleasure. So saying in other words, this is already a very important lesson to take, that Midat Adin, the attribute of judgment, of severity and Gvura, is really the foundation to all the pleasures in the world. If you would be satisfied, then how would you have any pleasure? If you now drank a whole bottle of wine, the next cup of wine, you'll have pleasure from it? No, I already drank already three cups of wine. I'm not going to have more pleasure. I'm full. I'm satisfied. So when I'm satisfied and full, how can I get more pleasure? How do I get pleasure? I need to lack something. I need to desire it. I need to, to not have it. So the fact that I don't have it, then it becomes a vessel. So when I have it, it becomes no pleasure. With that said, I need to know how to sweeten the judgment. Because there's judgments against us all the time. Like I told you in the class before, the blessing comes from the world of Atzilut to the world of Bria, Etzira, Asiya, but it stops in the way from prosecution. Because I lie, I cheat, I slander, I steal, and I do things that are not appropriate. Some of them are not appropriate in the eyes of the Torah. Some of them are not appropriate in, the, in the, any human being will tell you we don't need the Torah from that. But when I do something negative or something that is not considered good, then I bring on myself this judgment. Now I need to know how to sweeten the judgments. How do I get rid of the dirty laundry, so to say? Okay. So like I told you before, our entire life is fixing things. It's called tikkunim. And sometimes you hear people that they talk, oh, I need a tikkun for this, a tikkun for that. Because if I do now a damage, that's what I educate my kids. If you now steal, forget about the sin that you did. That's one thing. You deal with the master of the universe right now. But you affected another person. Now the person is lacking because of you. So you have to fix it. You have to appease the person, whatever it takes. Now you brought a stain on your soul. You have to fix that. It's not so simple. It's not that you owe me anything. You have a personal and most important, you deal with the master of the universe. And you don't want to deal with him. Because there the judgment is precise. But every act that I do, there's a, there's a, a snowball reaction after that. You get affected, you get affected, I get affected. So all oh, my life I have to fix things. It's called tikkunim. Sometimes it's from severe sins, from not severe sins, from little things. Anything that happens to me in my life is a tikkun. I bump into you for whatever circumstances, there's a tikkun there. You did something to me, there's a tikkun there. I have to understand, we learned that both in Sharek Dusha and Tomer Dvora and in Sharek Gilgulim. Any encounter that I have, something has to happen from that. If we bump in the street and we talk about something, has to be some tikkun here. Some people I bump in them twice a day. Some people I see them once in my lifetime. 
Some people they help me, some people they, they, they hurt me, some people I hurt them or some people I benefit them. Either way, looking at it, any encounter that you have in your life, there's a tikkun there. You have to be focused. We learned that two classes ago in Tomer Dvorah. I highly recommend to follow the series. We learned that, that you have to have this wisdom that anything that happens to you, not to do it in an OCD way, to do it in a healthy way, that you have to make a quick analogy. Why is this happening right now? To know how to react the right way, how to derive the right message, and how to apply it. So everything in our world is a tikkun. Now, in any action that I do, always has to become a preparation. And that's what I'm talking about in any type of action. You want to cook, then you have to go have an action. You have to need a preparation. Go to the, to the market and buy your food. Anything that you do, it has to be a preparation to that. You're going on a vacation, you have to pack. And that, of course, is the same thing in the spiritual world. Anything that I want to do has to come first a preparation. You want to celebrate Shabbat, then two days before that you buy the ingredients, the day before that you have to cook. Same thing with that. any holidays. The rule in anything in this world that before you do any action has to be what's called hachana, preparation. That our sages say that in many cases the preparation is more important than the action. I want to put now fill in. You know what a preparation needs to be? What happened? A cow needs to be slaughtered. And then the skin, it has to be skin. The skin has to be dried for months. And then to go through a certain process until I get leather straps. And then to get the parchment. And then to make the ink. And then to write it. Oh, you know, just to put fill in on a year of process. That's the preparation. Now, does the preparation need to happen every time I want to put fill in on? No, that's a different type of preparation. But everything in this world requires a preparation. Now... I'm going to say now something that might be not so clear in the beginning, but I'll explain it. Every picture in the movie of my life needs to be re fixed. Okay? Needs to be fixed. And then that picture goes up to its root. Now let me explain it a little bit different. Our life is like a movie. Okay? My movie is X amount of years. Your movie is X amount of years. Now, if you're looking at the old school film, it was a long uh, ribbon and it had like these boxes and picture, 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 picture. Then you put it in the projector and the film runs and frames. 16 frames, 18 frames, whatever. That's our life. Picture, 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 picture. Saying that every moment in my life has to be fixed. It's a picture that has to be fixed. Now, I can't see all the pictures. Even if I live my own life, I can't see all the pictures. I only see one, another one, another one. The more the person is refined and their intellectual part is refined to a point that it's aligned with the neshama, the more the person elevates himself, the more pictures they can see. Who are the ones that can see all these pictures? Are tzaddikim, righteous people. They, they don't see the picture, they see everything. But for that, your mind has to be so refined. Your intellectual part has to be refined. Your soul has to be refined that you see a broad picture. Eh, great tzaddikim, Moshe Rabbeinu, it says that Hashem took him on the mountain and showed him all the world, all the way. It says, Adayama Acharon, till the last ocean. Our commentary says, don't say Adayam Acharon, Adayom Acharon. Till the last day, Moshe Rabbeinu was able to see a vision all the years, thousands of years forward. Sometimes you go to great tzaddikim and they don't look at you just the big, they see your beginning, your middle, your end. We don't see that. We're very limited. But nevertheless, when you have this film, all the pictures are including in it. You just have the limit to only see one at a time. Which means that in my life, all the pictures exist. Everything exists. That's why our sages say that everything is already predestined. I just don't see it. Going back to the analogy, then every picture on the, on the, uh, the, the how do you call the, the film, the film, the ribbon, has to do a tikkun. Now when I fix it, then it can go back to its source. That's what we learned recently. 
uh, how uh, last class in the parasha we learned how important is our time because when you miss the time something was supposed to be done then a certain rectification now when I'm able to do a tikkun for a certain, a certain act then it goes back to its source that's why I said when I, I have an encounter and I bump into you in the street how are you, where are you it has to be a tikkun, that's a frame now it can be done with I'm sharing you some words of Torah. It can be done that you are about to tell me Lashon Ara and I'm like, I don't want to hear. And it can be done in many different ways. But there's an encounter between us. Sometimes the encounter can go spoil in a second. That you tell me something, a comment that I don't like, and I answer back and I hurt your feelings and you answer me and woo, a whole a, a fight starts. And it can be a positive encounter. It all depends on me. But nevertheless, every frame that I fix goes up to its source. Now, with that said, it means that on the film, on the movie of my life, there are many cases that we already pre-know that is going to have to be fixed. You understand what I'm saying? If everything is predestined, if the movie is already there, then there are certain points that I know there's going to be something bad and I need to fix it. I'm going to have a fight with you and for whatever reason and then we have to appease each other or apologize or I have to do a certain action. But the point to take from that is that the, so to say, the program, the software that holds all the information already knows problem, future problems that are going to happen. When I get married, I am in love with my wife. In my mind, I will never fight with her. Oh, wow, well, we're going to be seeing roses all of our life. Two years down the line, you start fighting. Oh, I didn't expect that. I didn't intend to fight with you when we got married two years ago. I thought everything will be great. Same thing with everything in my life. I don't intend my kids to go on a certain path or business to go bad. Uh, when I go into a business, do I uh, uh, dream for the business to collapse? My vision is the business should grow. So, but nevertheless, the surprise is on the way. So in my life, there's going to be all sorts of things that are going to be required already to be dealt with, and I, I didn't even get there. How many times did you hear from somebody? Oh, wait in 20 years. You'll deal with that. You don't get rid of uh, problems until the last day you live. You're going to deal with problems. So, based on what I told you before, that everything in this world is rooted in the world above, so even if some encounter in this world is destined to be negative, I can go to the root of it and fix it in the root. And that can be with my relationship with my wife, can be with the health, can be with livelihood. Saying in other words that we have the ability to, and the knowledge to go into the main program and to fix things in the root. Because if there's a problem in the root, it will manifest into the world. In many different ways. And if this is the case, if I'm able to fix something in the root, so the picture that it will reflect on the screen, so to say, will be already with the changes. Right? And again, I'm using the analogy of the film and I'm projecting it onto the wall. So if I'm projecting the picture on the wall and it needs to be fixed, then it's not going to be in reality something positive. But if I can go already to the root and fix it, then the picture that will present it on the wall will look completely different. Kind of like going into a time machine. That you see something bad happen, it says, ah, if I could go back now and change it, it, the result will be different. But we don't have a time machine. So the point is, saying now, let's finish with all the, uh, the analogies and the metaphors. I have the knowledge how to go to the root of things and to change it before it becomes bad, that the picture that will be presented will be good. The exact same thing is done on Rosh Hashanah. We spoke about it in the previous class. That really, when do you get all your blessings? On Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah, you decide how much money you're going to make. Not you decide. God decides how much money you're going to make. If you're going to be successful or not, if you're going to buy a new home or not, if you're going to get married, divorce, kids, everything is decided. Everything is written. You can't change it, by the way. The only thing you can change is how it's going to come about and how much struggles you're going to have to get it. 
and how you're going to behave along the way. But the, the destination is decided. You choose the route. So in Rosh Hashanah, we have 48 hours that whatever we do on Rosh Hashanah already sweetens in advance all the entire year, right? The more I do that day, in advance, it's already selected and decided. That's why sometimes when you want to approach these concepts in English, it doesn't work. Because in Hebrew, how is the holiday called? Rosh Hashanah, right? Rosh means ahead. But when I say that all the blessings are given to me, me Rosh Hashanah, you know what it means in Hebrew? Ahead of time. Me Rosh Hashanah. I go now and I do a job. And I ask you, how are you going to pay me? And I tell you, I'm going to pay with a check. And I tell you, can you pay me merosh? Can you pay me before I did the job? Yeah, you come up with good credentials. I'm going to pay you up front. So merosh means up front. So if I do something the right way, berosh Hashanah, I get paid merosh. Hashem says, I will give you in advance your blessing. That's why when you... To learn this in English, you're saying Rosh Hashanah, doesn't make sense. Simple Hebrew, the word Mirosh means in advance. So Rosh Hashanah is the ultimate mitu kadin b'shorsho, sweetening the judgment in its root, before it happened even. Before it came about, I'm already sweetening it. Can you imagine that I already did the job before it was already done? That's the ultimate mituk adin. That's Rosh Hashanah. That's why how Rosh Hashanah is called Yom Adin, the Day of Judgment. Now, one can explain it. Oh, yeah, just Judgment Day that Hashem is judging everybody. Correct. But it's also the day that I already sweetened the judgment before the year started even. Because I convinced Hashem with my great prayers that I deserve to earn X amount of money, that I deserve to do this, this, and this. That's why it's called Merosh Hashanah. I got already got already everything prior in advance. So Rosh Hashanah is the ultimate time for what's called Mitukadin. No question here, you can't argue with that. That's the top, the best day of the year to set, so to say, my year. But we have another three days in the year where we are charging the batteries. Because throughout the year, the batteries constantly go out. It's almost like, you know, everything that technology comes to offer us is for us to take the knowledge and now to apply it with my connection to Hashem. So before you leave your home, you charge your phone. Chas v'shalom, you should be stuck without a battery. So you have a charger in the car and a charger here. But the battery, be, the more you use it, it deflates. The battery, you run out of battery. But if you're smart, every time that you're next to an outlet, you charge your battery. Why? Because I don't want to run on a juice. Some people, they let the battery go all the way out and they're stuck without a phone. But a smart person goes with a charger and every given moment plugs in the phone. Why? Because I need to be fully charged all the time. Same thing here. Rosh Hashanah is when you charge your neshama. You charge everything. But it runs out. So Hashem gave us three points on the calendar where we charge the batteries again. What are these three points? Three festivals. Sukkot, Pesach, and Shavuot. Don't, don't look at the proximity because Shavuot is close to Pesach. It doesn't, it, doesn't make any, it doesn't make any difference. But these are the three times. Now, how do we call a festival in Hebrew? Regal. Right? Shalosh Regalim, it's called. In, in English, we call it the three festivals. But the word that the Torah uses, it's called it Shalosh Regalim. And not, not only that, when we had Bet HaMikdash and we used to go to Bet HaMikdash, how is that called in Hebrew? La'alot la'regel. Why you say la'alot la'regel? It doesn't make any sense grammat gr grammatically in Hebrew. La'alot la'regel. <laughs> la'alot means to ascend, to go up. La'regel, regel is a, is a foot, is a leg. Okay, so now it's the festival. But why am I going up la'regel? So now is definitely not the time to explain it, but the word regel in Hebrew... You know how we have the 72 names of Hashem that are three letters. The word regel, reish, gimel, lamed, is a very high place in the spiritual world. Not one of Hashem's names, but it's a very 
high place in the spiritual world. So it says, La'alot la'regel, I'm ascending to a very high spiritual place. Now, when we're looking at the actual regalim, these festivals, then it's very clear to see what's going on here. Pesach, what are we celebrating on Pesach? Freedom. We went out of slavery. Any, any child knows. What are we commemorating? We went out of Egypt. So Pesach, the, the spiritual power of Pesach is breaking through all my limitations, all my addictions, all my weaknesses. I'm breaking through, breaking out of my state of limitation. It's called chirut, freedom. Okay. Sukkot, what do we do in Sukkot? Besides building a sukkah, I know you were about to say building a sukkah or shaking the lulav. What do we do? There's also another name for the week of Shavuot. It's called Simchat Bet HaShoeva. Lishov means to pump. What do we do in Sukkot? We pump Simcha. For the entire year. Can you imagine not being, or being sad the entire year? Most people, they have difficulties with joy and happiness. One of the most hardest things to deal with is when you're lacking joy and happiness. But Sukkot is the time, exactly how we call it, Simchat Bet HaShoeva, the rejoicing of pumping Simcha. The whole week, you just observe the holiday, you have true happiness in your heart for the rest of the year. It doesn't matter, you have money, you don't have money, you lost, you won, you gained, you suffered. Happiness doesn't come from, from your financial state, doesn't come from how much money you have in your bank, or how much money you don't have in the bank. That's the real simcha, has nothing to do with anything physical. If you're married, you're not married, you're sick, you... The real, real simcha comes from the depth of the neshama. I explained that thoroughly in many, many of my classes about Purim. Because with Purim we are commanded to be with simcha. But nevertheless, real happiness comes from within. When do you gain this true happiness? Is on Sukkot. Observe the holiday for seven days the right way. You charge your battery with joy and happiness for the rest of the year. Okay. So what's the significance of Shavuot? What are we doing on Shavuot? What happened on Shavuot? We received the Torah. Sounds on the surface pretty simple. Pesach sounds pretty exciting. Going out of slavery. Woo. Sukkot. Simcha. Torah. Our sages explain that receiving the Torah is the ultimate sweetening of the judgments. The mituk adin achigadol. Some even say greater than Rosh Hashanah. Why? Because on Rosh Hashanah, you know, on uh, uh, Shavuot, you know what we get? Each and every one of us has shares. In the Torah. How we say, Ten chelkenu betoratecha. I have a share in the Torah. Can you imagine having share now in uh, these, one of these big companies? I don't want to have any connection with one of these big companies. But nevertheless, can you imagine having shares in some big company? And then you share the, sell the shares. So we have a share in the Torah. Each and every one of us has a portion in the Torah. I, I mean, I don't know what it is. You don't know what it is. But we all have a portion in the Torah. I call it shares. On the night of Shavuot, I get my share. Now, it's not that I'm getting here a check. I am getting my neshama, because the neshama has the share. On the night of Shavuot, I'm getting my neshama. You know how would you would feel if you would experience your neshama for one second? You know that a few years ago, I don't know if you remember, Maybe three years ago, there was one guy who came here, who is a Kohen, came, okay, I'm not going to say too many details, somewhere from North America, from a, a state that there's barely any Jews there, and it was the month of Elul. After Shacharit, I blew the shofar, and he fainted on the spot. The guy just went down and fainted, and started getting these weird twitches. He had to order an ambulance. And he says it was the first time when he woke up, he says the first time I ever heard a shofar. He heard the blowing of the shofar. It wasn't even Yom Kippur or Rosh Hashanah. Some people have the custom to blow the shofar every day on, on Elul. So I blew the shofar very strong and he fainted. He, had a, he experienced his neshama for, for three, two or three seconds. And the neshama woke up in him, his body couldn't take it. If we would experience our neshama for one second or one minute, we would be on such a high. Some people can experience their neshama. Here a minute, there a minute. Of course, righteous people, they, they live 
through the neshama. We don't feel the neshama. If we would feel our soul, we would be electrocuted from pleasure and wisdom and love to Hashem, and we would be operating on a completely different level. On the night of Shavuot, which is like the ultimate sweetening of the judgment, each and every one of us gets the, my chelik, my part, my portion in the Torah. Really what I'm getting, I'm getting my, my neshama. Whether you're going to feel it or not, that I can't guarantee to you. But that's what happens. Okay. Now let's move a little bit forward. It says by the Arizal in a book called Shara Kavanot, they say something very, uh, very, uh, um, I don't even know how to define it. Profound, scary, amazing. He says something like this. Any person that will be up all night in the night of Shavuot, it's guaranteed to him that he's not going to die that year. Yashlim shnato. He will go through the entire year without dying. Wow. You know what a promise that is? Who can give you such a promise? Is there any insurance company that can give you such a promise? Narizal is telling you, all you need to do is stay up all night on the night of Shavuot. Guarantee you're going you're gonna to finish your year. Now, we're not so clear about if he's talking about till next Shavuot or till Rosh Hashanah when the year is over. But it doesn't matter. That's a promise. I don't know how many people can take on themselves. More than that, what, you know what else he says? Lo yara lo shum nezek bashanai. No harm will be done to this person in that year. Wow. How can he do that? What kind of a promise he says? So this is how he's all saying in Shara Kavanot. On top of that, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says in a different place in the Zohar, We'll finish the year with peace. These are pretty bold statements. Now I'll tell you where it's kind of confusing because I know people who stayed up all night on Shavuot and they, they died. What does the Rizal mean? Yashlim shnato, lo yekonezek, he's going to... Uh, 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 lived to the fullest, that we're not going to be harmed, could be that it's also affecting the neshama. But at least we're getting message number one, that on the night of Shavuot, we stay up all night. Now, that night is called the Lel Matan Torah, the eve of Matan Torah, because that's what happened when they received the Torah. They also, you know what happened that night? Well, one of the reasons why we stay up all night is because they fell asleep. So we have to stay up all night, chas v'shalom, not to miss the Torah. But we have to understand that we have a message that we have to stay up all night that night. Okay. Now we have to understand another thing. Because we're talking that the uh, holiday of Shavuot is because we received the Torah. Now can you really define what the Torah is? If I would ask you now, what is the Torah? Most people will not get it right. They will say godly message, the books of Moses, whatever. But if you would be asked now, can you define to me what is the Torah? I can already tell you, erase what you, already, what you knew up until now. Now I'm going to give you a new definition, which is really what the Torah is. The Torah is the vessel that pulls the neshama into the body. Okay? I'll say it again. The Torah is the vessel that pulls the soul into the body. Most people don't even know that. They, they think it's text or some other profound, uh, esoteric, uh, godly message. Now, another thing that it's going to do, the Torah, it's uh, enlightening the neshama while it's in the body. So, first of all, it brings the neshama into the body. You know what it means, what it means to pull... pull a spiritual being into a physical body and so to say bound them together that's what the Torah does more than that the Torah will illuminate the neshama while it's in the body most people when they live their life they only feel physical things when they're hungry they feel hungry when they're satisfied they feel satisfied when they're tired they feel tired they feel joy happiness pain they don't feel the neshama when was the last time you felt your neshama? So some people are a little bit more sensitive than the others. Some people say, I feel my neshama. Good, you're on the right path. I'm saying most people don't feel 
their neshama. They feel the desire to eat. They feel the desire to sleep. They feel the desire to be pleasured one way or another. They don't feel the neshama tickling them inside. And <laughs> I mean, you can feel that. I'm not saying that it's not possible. I'm just saying that's the reality. The Torah is the pipes that the godly infinite light comes from the world above to the world below. Remember we talked about the pipes before? That's the Torah. So again, the Torah is the pipes that the infinite light that comes from the world above can penetrate into the neshama. Because the neshama is in your body. In prison, it needs its light. If your neshama, your soul is sad, you'll be sad. With all the money in the world, with all the fame, with all the glory. If you are poor, homeless, sick, and wounded, but your soul is happy, you will be dancing in the street all day long. Your soul needs sustenance like you need air and water and food and sleep. Your soul needs the exact same thing. The more the soul is content, happy, and, and inspired, you'll be like that. That's very simple. People are depressed, the neshama is sad. People are uh, sick, the neshama, there's a problem. It's everything from the neshama. Neshama is a soul. So knowing that the Torah is the pipes, through them the infinite light, the light from Hashem, the blessing, comes into the neshama. Okay, so now I know the Torah is a whole different thing than what I thought. The Torah is not a halacha book, not a history book. No, well, it is, but, but the, the definition is completely different now. Now, what do we do on Shavuot? We stay up all night. And we learn and we read a certain tikkun. It's called Tikkun El Shavuot. And that's the connection to the root, to the light of my root of my neshama. Simply said. Why? Because the teachings of Kabbalah explains that the holiday of Shavuot is my link, my connection to the sphere that is called Keter. All the last seven weeks of Svirat HaOmer, we are counting. Chesed Sheba Chesed, Chesed Sheba Gvura, Gvura Sheba Tiferet. We're refining ourselves and climbing and climbing and climbing for 49 days. The holiday of Shavuot, if you did Svirat HaOmer the right way, then on the holiday of Shavuot, you're connected to the Sphira of Keter. The highest of all the Sphirot, the source of all abundance. That's what happens by default. Don't do anything. Just sit there with your cheesecake. You're connected to Sfirat Keter. Assuming that you did your Sfirat HaOmer the right way, that you refined yourself, you spent a little bit of time on that, not just saying today is the 34th day. A little bit of meditation, a little bit of self-refinement. But the holiday of Shavuot is Chibur Sfirat Keter, my attachment to the Sphira of Keter, which we can't really understand really what it means. But I'm telling you already that's the highest form of connection to the Sfirot above, where I get all my needs, spiritual, physical, emotional, and so forth. Now, what is really the definition of Keter? Keter, the, the uh, translation is, means a crown, but Keter, the essence of Keter, is the source of... Uh, I'll tell you the word in Hebrew, then I, I don't know, I'll have to find how to translate it. In Hebrew, it's called Shoresh HaNevi'ah. Now, Nevi'ah means to sprout, when something starts. But Nevi'ah can also be translated as a result. You do a certain action, it will be a result. Nevi'ah is also, a, a, the translation will be derive or arise. So Keter really has the power when everything starts. So I'll choose now the word to sprout, because that's the beginning. So how does something sprout? Because it has the power. Keter, that's that power. It's the highest of all the Sfirot. That's where everything starts. And your Shavuot is when I connect to the Keter. Everything can be rejuvenated, starting all from the beginning. Very high level. Now, the essence to get connected to this high place and to uh, uh, sweeten all the judgments, that's the holiday of Shavuot. That's when I do it. Saying, in other words, that when I'm connected to Keter, I'm connected to the source of life. To, to make things simple. It's deep Kabbalistic terms, but when I'm connected 
to the sphere of Ketan, I'm connected to the source of life. Can you imagine being disconnected from the source of life? Now most people are disconnected in some type of a way, but I have the ability to connect to the source of life. Now, one might say, oh, so I have to wait the whole year for that auspicious moment. What if I'm sick that day? Chas v'shalom. What if something happens that day? So the answer is, of course, you can do it every day. Any day you can get connected to Ketel. But that's extremely difficult. Very, very difficult. Most people, not so easy to do. On Shavuot, just like that. You don't have to do much. It's almost like in Pesach. In Pesach, just follow the seder, 15 steps, eat, do whatever you do, you're connected by default to what's called organos, the hidden light. The most simple person in the world, just follow the Haggadah, it has 15 stops, that's why it's called seder, seder means an order. That's it, you're connected to organos. Same thing with Shavuot, just do what you need to do on that day, you are connected to Sfirat Keter, to the source of life. You are opening all the gates, all the pipes are being cleaned and rejuvenated. Can you imagine what a powerful day we are going to experience in a few days? Now, first of all, like I told you, assuming, and I, and I you know a lot of people say, oh, oh shoot, I messed up, because I was about to say, assuming that the last seven weeks of Sfirat Omer, you did it right, most people say, <laughs> <laughs> I stopped counting after three days. Okay, doesn't matter. Listen, you do your best. And you do what you can, and even if you forgot to count, continue counting the next day. Learn about Sfirat Omer. Do your self-refinement. There's things to do, and nothing is lost. But assuming you paid attention for Sfirat Omer, and comes the holiday of Shavuot, and you're observing it, if you're doing the basics of the basics, you still can be connected to Sfirat Keter. So even if you feel that you didn't really do your work on Sfirat Omer, no problem. You can do the summary. Last year I wrote a beautiful summary of all the 49 Sfirot in one page. A summary of, of Sfirat Omer. You know, we'll include it in the video so that people can download it and read it. Very, very... Somebody asked me to do it for a certain event. I took all 49 Sfirot of every night and summarizing it in, in literally a page and a half. Read that. Catch up what you didn't do the last 47 days. Okay? But there are a few things that we need to do so I can really target myself and be connected to Sfirat Keter. And why do I want to do that? That's the source of life. I'm cleaning all the pipes, sweetening all the judgments. Everything in the, the, the film of my life, I can go to the root and change everything and reroute everything. And it's a very powerful night. Okay, so our sages give us a few uh, uh, recommendations what need to be done on the night of Shavuot. Oh, of, uh, of Shavuot, which this year will be on Motzei Shabbat. First of all, it's called Nid, Nid Nud Shena, staying up all night. And now is definitely no time to explain why, but staying up all night is a very powerful thing. Now, of course, staying up and reading and learning Torah, not being in a bar. I'll touch it in a second if it's for women or not. If you want the quick answer, yeah. Okay? The, the quick answer is, I say, yeah. Women should stay up all night too and learn Torah too. Hey, listen, if you have kids and you have to be with them, or it's hard for you, and you, chas v'shalom, not so well, that's a whole different thing. But if you can, yeah, stay up. And if you can't, then go to sleep, wake up at midnight, and stay up at least till 4 o'clock in the morning. I'll give you my quick explanation what to do if you can't or you, it's hard. But yeah, I would suggest anybody to do that. Now again, now is definitely not the time. Maybe another time we'll do a class why staying up all night is so powerful. But our sages say, especially the Arizal, if you stay up all night and you learn Torah, this is one of the most powerful tikkunim you can do to the soul. I'm sure you're familiar with the sins that is called karet. Unfortunately, we all sin in sins that are called karet because desecrating Shabbat is karet. Karet means to chop off. Eating chametz on Pesach is karet. Uh, working or driving or eating on Yom Kippur is karet. Forbidden relations is karet. There are 36 karetot in the Torah. A lot of them are really not connected to us because it's eating from the holy sacrifices, what's called kochim, that's karet too doing a seance, doing a, a witchcraft, all these things. But nevertheless, there's 36 kretot. 
You know what it is to fix a karet? It means that all nine spherot of my neshama are chopped off, just one sphera is still connected, hanging on a string, and it's very, very difficult to do tikkun karet. The Rizal says if you stay up all night and you learn Torah, not staying up in a bar, that's the irony. Some people will stay up all night in a bar with no problem. On the night of Shavuot to stay up and read Torah, they fall asleep within three seconds. But the Rizal says that if you stay up all night and you read Torah, learn Torah, you fix one karet. But on Shavuot, our sages explain, you have to stay up all night. And again, I'll give you the more uh, details how you want to do it. That's number one. Number two, the Rizal says, Litnaik mo keter. Behave like a keter. Now again, don't take the translation, put it in Google Translate, and keter will be a crown. Because you'll be like, how am, I prete- how am I acting like a keter? I'll tell you how do you act like a keter. Keter is a spiritual level. In a lower level, we experience something that is called good and bad. Okay? A lower level of conducting yourself is that I'm good with the good and I'm bad with the bad. So I'm good with my wife and my parents and my kids because they're good to me, I'm good with them. But if somebody's bad to me, oh, I'm bad with them. She said this about me, I'm not giving them anything. That's being bad with the bad. You help me, I'll help you. But if you go and slander me, trash my name, you steal from me, you bad, uh, no. Or you're my enemy, or you threaten me. This is called Raim Araim. I'm bad with the bad. That's not the way Keter behaves. The way Keter behaves, Raktov, everything is good. Can you imagine if Hashem would be good with the good and bad with the bad? In one way it would be good, because all the evil people will cease to exist. But also we, when we do bad. Hashem acts like a keter, everything is good. You know what we say when we pray the Birkat Amazon, the benching after the meal? Hatov umetiv lakol. The good and is beneficial to everybody. What do our sages say? Hatov, he does good to the good ones. Hametiv to the bad ones. Hashem does good to, to evil people. And why? Because he wants them to do tshuva. Hashem doesn't want to destroy the evil people. He tells them, do tshuva. You know, Hashem told Paro, do tshuva. Do tshuva, you'll win everything. Hashem told many evil people, do tshuva. Now, if you don't, and you don't, and you don't, then eventually I'll destroy you. But even us, we shouldn't have the desire for somebody to be killed, murdered, or die. We have to pray for them to do tshuva. There's a lot of people that I don't like either. Now, who am I to say that's 100% Amalek? Who am I to say such a thing? We have all sorts of uh, individuals in our parliament that on the surface seem like Zera Amalek, evil people, but who am I to say he's an evil people? I should pray for them to do tshuva. Can you imagine one of them doing tshuva and becoming good? Last week we had a class in the Erev Rab series about uh, the wife of the Samech Mem, L-I-L-I-T. Somebody says, ask me a question. Is she doomed to be destroyed by the master of the universe or can she do tshuva? I think in the eyes of the master of the universe, he wants everybody to do tshuva. Can you imagine her doing tshuva? Can you imagine now one of the evil individuals of the uh, rulers of the world doing tshuva and suddenly going according to the rules of the Torah? That's much better than destroying them. So now I sidetracked a little bit, but acting like the character is everything is good. Even if I don't like you, even if you're bad for me, I still have to be good for you. I don't need to like you. I don't need to love your behavior, but I still need to love you or help you. And again, we're not talking here about now, I'm saying it as a disclaimer because a lot of people ask me, but what if my somebody raped me? Do I need to be? No, I'm not talking about a rapist, a molester. I'm not talking about these things. You don't have to like your molester. Chas v'shalom. I'm talking about normal circumstances. That I have to behave like Keter, that everything is good. Now, it doesn't mean just me and you. Because a lot of people say, it will say, it's very confusing. That person is evil. Uh, do I do... Listen, we're not going to start analyzing every individual in the parliament and in the uh, uh, governments. This is not what we're talking about. That everything is good, meaning that everything also happens in my life. I don't have money, it's good. I don't have health right now, it's good. I got kicked out of my apartment, it's good. Everything is good. That's behaving like Ketel, that I accept that everything in my life is good. 
And I know, being kicked out of the apartment and being homeless, it's bad. No, no, it's good. It's 100% good. This business deal didn't work out. I've been working on this business deal for a year. It didn't work out. It's good. A different business deal will come. So behaving like Keter, hakol tov, rak tov. En ra yored min hashamayim. Nothing bad comes up down from the heavens. Kol man de rachman avid le tav avid. Everything that Hashem does is only for the good. You know what, what a switch in your mind you have to do? I'm not talking just people. Every situation in your life, <laughs> and we all have bad situations, it's all good. It's all good. It will end up being better. So, two things that I need to focus on. Not sleeping and le behave like Ketel. Now, what do I need to do? Practically. It says that every spiritual action that I do can be done with a lot of power or with a little bit of power. Okay? I'll say it again. Every spiritual act that you do, I can put filling on now. It can be done with a lot of power when I'm really having the right kavanah, the right intention. I'm doing it after preparation and, and with the praying, it comes with a lot of power. Or it can be done in five minutes because I'm rushing, tick, 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 putting the filling on. That's one example out of many. You can light Shabbat candles like this and you can prepare and take a shower and put beautiful clothes and read Tehilim and pray Mincha and really meditate and pray to Hashem. And same spiritual act with a lot of power, with a little bit of power. You got the point, no need to give more examples. All depends on the preparation, like I told you before. And I gave you now an example with the lighting candles. Many women light candles on the last fraction of the second with sweat on their face and food all over their clothes and the house is a mess and I'm not blaming anybody I know that's what usually happens but some women get to the point that like I told you they relax take a shower put on their beautiful Shabbat clothes their makeup their jewelry, they read Shira Shirim, Tehilim, Perek Shira, doesn't matter what light, the candles when they're... And they're thinking of every living soul and praying for him and praying for her. And the preparation makes a big difference. And again, this is with any type of mitzvah. I can come full power, do the same spiritual act with all the power, which will depend on the preparation and can be done like that. It says in the book of Tehillim something very, very powerful. This can be found in chapter Kuf Gimel 103, verse 2. Translation, bless the Lord, his angels, those mighty in strength who perform his word to hearken to the voice of his word. I'm not 100% happy with the translation, but we'll stick with this for right now, okay? What is this verse so powerful? The Zohar says, what is the power? Uh, I'll use the word power now. The word that the Zohar is using is koach. Now, koach can be power, but koach can also be energy and might. But what is the power that we have as humans when I want to do any physical action? Or spiritual action. There has to be some power behind it. Right? There has to be some type of energy. Anything that I want to do. Walk, dance, jump, work out, drive. Has to be some, some energy that moves my, my body. And it can be a physical act and a spiritual act. There's no questions. What is that power? Can you answer what is that power? Right now I want to get up and pour myself a cup of water. Simple act. Has to be power in the hand. And another power here, and to turn, and to go like that. And I'm just giving you one example out of billions. Question now, what is the power that makes me go and do anything? Because sometimes I'm lazy, I don't, want to, I don't want to do anything. The answer is that Hashem gives a commandment to any human being to do an action, and then gives you 100% of the power and the energy to do it. So when Hashem tells you to fight your struggles, He gives you all the power to do it. Of course, if He gives you the natural power to go to the faucet and drink a cup of water, He gives you the power to do it. 
he tells you to pray, then he will give you the power to get up and pray. But even when Hashem tells you to deal with a crisis, with a disaster, with the loss of a loved one, with the collapse of a business, a horrible divorce, doesn't matter what, he puts you in a situation and he gives you a challenge, he gives you 100% the power to fight it and to operate with no questions here. Positive or negative, doesn't matter. So Hashem commands us to do things. Wake up in the morning. Go, you go and work, you go and work out. You go and learn, you go and do this. We all have different agendas and things that we do all day long. Hashem gives me my power, gives me the command and also gives me all the abilities and all the powers to do it. I can't come and say, oh, Hashem wants me to do this, but He's not giving me that. False. Now, the person can receive 100% of that power and the person can receive 90% of the power, 50%, even 1%. Hashem gives. It all depends what you take and what you will receive. Now, what is that depending on? How is that depending that I will receive 100% of the power that Hashem told me? Hashem now puts me in a situation and I need the energy and the power, the koach to deal with it. What will determine how much percentage I get of the power? Between 1% to 100%. Something very simple. It's called Naase Venishma. We will do and then we would listen. We spoke about it in the previous class, how I told you there are two places in the Torah. One in Parashat Nitro and one in Parashat Mishpatim. In Parashat Mishpatim, after receiving the Torah, we said Naase Venishma. And in Parashat Nitro, we just said Kol Asher Hashem Yaseh Naase. Everything that Hashem told us to do, we'll do. But the power of Naase Venishma that I accept, I do, and then I ask, that will define how much percentage of energy I get? Now, saying in other words, sometimes I do things, but I don't do it 100%. I don't do the Naseh 100%. So I'm not going to get 100%. Going back to the verse in Tilim, chapter 103, it says that the angels of Hashem are called Giborei Koach. Uh, those mighty in strength. Why the angels are called Giborei Koach? Because angel does exactly what Hashem told them to do. There's no negotiating. There's no uh, uh, any uh, own opinions. An angel is a robot, basically. That's what it is. It's a machine. Whatever Hashem tells the angel to do, the angel will perform without questions. We are not angels. So David the Melech calls the angels those mighty in strength. Saying, in other words, they act with no weaknesses on the way. No doubts, no questions. What if, what if and what that? We don't act like that. We act completely, completely different. Because we always ask questions and we're looking for what's the benefit here and what is it good for me here? A human being that doesn't do will never understand. Which means, if you only learn something in theory, and you never did it, you'll never understand what you learn. Theory is worthless. You have to practically do it. If you're just theorizing on something, but you actually never did it, I can learn now, bless you. I can learn now all the laws of shechita, of slaughtering the animal. For months. I learn all the laws. If I will not go and slaughter the chicken, or the cow, I don't know how to do it. I know the laws, I know the theory, but I never actually did it. And this is one example out of many. I don't know why that came up to my mind, but that's one example out of many. If I don't do something, how can I know what it is? I can learn about it. I can theorize about it, but I will never know. What does it mean to, that I have to do, that I have to make uh, some action? Is that I'm making a vessel in order to understand the light. Okay, let's take it to a Kabbalistic terms. There's always going to be a relation between a, a light and a, and a vessel. So when I do an action, I'm making a vessel that I can understand the light. Most people don't understand the Torah because you didn't do it. How can you understand the Torah, that it's a godly wisdom, if you never did it? And then you have all the questions. Why should I do this? Why should I do that? But you never did it. First do, then you'll understand So I, in order for me to understand, first I have to do. Saying in other words, Hamasehu koach havana. The action is the power of understanding. 
So when I do and act, what the Torah says, Na'asev and Ishma, that's what gives me the koch. That I first do, I'm not asking any questions. Most people ask questions. Go to pray. What is it in for me? What am I going to get? Some people come to pray in the morning because they just don't want to deal with their wife. Some people come to pray to in the morning because they're going to make business meeting the other people. Some people come and pray in the morning because they saying, if I'll pray, business will be thriving. Everybody has their agenda. Now a lot of people pray because they want to be connected to Hashem. And that's much more noble. But you're coming to pray to be connected to Hashem or you're praying, coming to pray because Hashem commanded you to come and pray. If you're coming, this is what's called Lasot L'Shem Shamayim, for the sake of heavens. If you're coming because that's what Hashem wants you to do, then your gauge in energy, whoop, you get all the way. Because you're not doing it with questions. You're doing it. This is not seven Ishma. So when Hashem puts me in some situations that I need to deal with, if I start asking questions, then my gauge of my, my, the volume of the energy is very low. Because I'm not doing an Aseh here. I'm doing... Uh, what am I doing here? So, the concept is a little bit difficult to understand, but I have to understand that everything that Hashem tells me to do, first I do it because Hashem wants me to do it. It took me many years to understand when people say, you have to do it Lashem Shamayim. You have to do it for the sake of heavens. What do you mean the sake of heavens? What, what, what am I doing it? For the sake of the, the government? Of course I'm doing it for Shamayim. I couldn't understand that I'm doing it because Hashem told me to do it. Why don't you steal? One person will tell you, because I don't want to be caught and arrested. Oh, so you're afraid of the police. Why don't you steal? Because I, I don't think it's uh, the right thing to do. Why don't you steal? Because it doesn't belong to me. You know what's the right answer? Because Hashem told me not to steal. That's it. The fact that it's not acceptable by other societies, who cares? If it's, what, it says in the Torah, not ignore. That's it, I'm doing it because it says in the Torah. I'm not doing it because I'm not a thief, I am a thief, I like you, I don't like you. That's my common sense. I'm doing it because it says clearly in the Torah, don't steal. Not take enough. Which means that everything that it says in the Torah, first I do it because it says in the Torah, then I can say, yeah, it's also not a nice thing to do. That's not seven ishma. Now this is a very simple explanation. How is it about when Hashem puts me in a situation that I have to deal with a lawsuit, horrible divorce, a child that is sick, chas v'shalom, Financial law, then I have to deal with the situation. Why do you think the situation came from? Shem, Shem puts me in this situation. So he also gives me the tools how to deal with it. How do I get the most energy to deal with it? By accepting it that that's from Hashem. That's behaving like the kettle. Everything is from Hashem. It's not because of you, it's not because of you, it's not because I. That's the will of Hashem. Maybe according to nature, my behavior caused A, B, and C. But that's the will of Hashem. You can't ignore that Hashem signed and allowed it to happen. If you are ignoring that, it's heresy. That's the Ratzon of the Kadosh Baruch for me to deal with this right now. You accept that it's from Hashem. You're acting like Keter HaKol Tov. Hashem gives you the power to deal with it. So what do we have to do before accepting the Torah in a few days? Three things. The first thing that we need to do is accept on us the heavenly yoke. Lo, yoke. It's called Kabbalat Ol Machut Shemayim. Whatever Hashem tells me to do, then I need to do. Saying, in other words, I have to accept that there's a creator to the world. And now a lot of people will tell me, what am I talking? What are you talking about? I'm religious for 40 years. Of course I accept that there's a creator to the world. You might accept that there's a creator to the world, but you didn't accept him a year ago when you went bankrupt, or when you got divorced, or when you got sick, or when somebody embezzled money from you, or when this happened, then you forgot it's a shame. You were blaming all the world. So I know you accepted as a creator to the world, but the creator to the world created you, me, and everything else, which means he's the source of everything. Accepting the yoke of heaven is that I accept that there's the master to the universe and he controls everything, good, bad, everything is good. Everything is coming from the master of the universe. No ifs, no buts, no excuses, no because of him, not because of that. There's only one creator to the world. Next thing. Now, I'm, I'm saying it very briefly. This is not a simple thing to do. That you have to meditate and internalize every day that everything is from Hashem. There's one created to the world. Nothing happened because of him, 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 him. 
as a master to the universe. Next thing that we need to do, it says very clearly before we receive the Torah, I told you already before, Vayichan Sham, Vayichan Sham Israel, that the nation of Israel parked there, where? Underneath the nation, but it says Vayichan. Vayichan, that's singular. It should have been said Vayachanu, and they all parked there. Why does it mean, what does it mean, Vayichan? They parked there as one person, as one heart. Total unity. Complete unity. The Torah says in the book of Vaikra, chapter 19, verse 18, Rabbi Akiva says, That's the main foundation of the entire Torah. What is the translation? You should love your neighbor as yourself. Not so simple to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I told you that a few times my wife came once with a brilliant chidush, unbelievable. It doesn't work in English, it works in Hebrew. Because in Hebrew it says, Ve'ahavta le'recha kamocha. Ve'ahavta, you should love le'recha, your neighbor, kamocha, like yourself. Okay. My wife came and says, no, no, no. It's much more deeper. Ve'ahavta le'recha, you should love your neighbor, kamocha. How Hashem loves that person. Not like how you love yourself. That's, that's selfish. You should love your neighbor how Hashem loves him. Not like how you love yourself. Of course I love myself. I'm perfect. I'm the best in the... I'm God's gift to the world. Of course I love myself. But to love you like how Hashem loves you? Oh, that's much... More deep and definitely much harder. Because if Hashem would love you, you wouldn't exist. Of course Hashem loves you. I can't stand you. But Hashem loves you like He loves me. So if I need to love you, I need to love you how Hashem loves you. Sees only the good in you. Have mercy on you when you fail. That's the next thing I need to do. V'avta lecha now, why is that? Because when there's hate, if I hate you or anything else, I can connect to you. If I hate apples, I will never connect to the apple. Now, why would I hate, uh, hate, hate the apple? What did the apple do to me? But I hate apple. I hate it. But, what, but the apple didn't do anything to you. And you know what? You're losing. You can connect to the apple. Maybe there's a godly spark there that you need to elevate. I'm giving a funny example, but uh, if you hate me or I hate you, I'll never connect with you. And I'm missing out. Because we're all one big organism. So if when there's hate, there's no real connection. End of story. I cannot come to Matan Torah if I hate somebody. Simple as it. If you're coming on Motzei Shabbat to Matan Torah, if you hate somebody, it's not going to work. The whole thing, <laughs> erase the whole hour and a half we're talking. It's not going to work. You have to let it all go. I don't hate anybody. Even if you trashed my name and you stole my money and you do this, I don't hate anybody or anything. I have to come, clean my heart. It's the best thing to do anyways because when you carry hate, you carry it inside. You, you, you're punishing yourself. You're punishing yourself for somebody else's stupidity. Next, and number three. I know it sounds pretty easy what I'm saying, but it's not. But nevertheless, you want to do it. It says, our sages say, any kol avodah avoda. Every work, any action, anything that you do, and you're not doing it with real simcha, it's worthless. It says in the Torah, chapter, in the book of Dvarim, chapter 28, verse 47, all the curses in the Torah come to you for one reason, that you didn't serve Hashem. Let me read the translation. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with happiness and with gladness of your heart. That's all the curses in the Torah. Because they didn't serve Hashem with happiness. To a point that our sages say, any avodah, that I do without simcha, it's not that. It's like you, did, it's, you didn't do anything. So I have to really push myself to be besimcha. Now it's not so easy, because if you're sad, 
50 clowns are not going to make you happy. But that's not the simcha we're talking about. You don't need a clown to make you happy. You need your soul to be happy. Now, when is a person real happy? If you ask yourself the question, when are you real happy? You know when? When something good happens to you. You get good news, you're real happy. Everything works out, you're happy. When good things happen to you, you're happy. You know why? Because our consciousness is programmed that when I, something good happens, then I'm happy. But what happens when something not good happens? Then you're not happy. You're sad. When are you sad? When, <laughs> when things are not good. When things don't go your way. You planned something, didn't work out. You invested, didn't work out. You hoped, you cared, you dreamed, didn't hurt. So what's the clear definition of happiness and sadness? When things are going good, I'm happy. When things are going bad, I'm sad. But that's just my consciousness telling me that. How do I really come to a place of happiness? So first of all, I told you in Sukkot, that passed. You have to wait another five months now. You observe the holiday of Sukkot, you charge your soul with Simcha. Another way is that you feed your neshama, you feed your soul with what it needs. It needs prayer, it needs Torah, and it needs commandments. Like you need air, food, and water, that's what the, the soul needs. You deprive your soul from air, food, and water, Torah, prayer, and commandments, it will be sad. But... That's also not so simple. How do I get to a point that I'm happy? That I understand that everything that happens to me is good. Don't need to wait till Sukkot. And I don't, don't, don't need to, 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 to do any other things. You need to understand that everything that happens to you is good. When you internalize that, by default you're always happy because everything is good. Anything that happened, you missed the bus, you missed the train, this didn't work out, it's all good, it's all good. So you're happy all the time. Why? Because everything is good. You know, there's a famous uh, quote by the Rebbe from Kotz, who says, en avera liot besimcha, batzvut, there's no sin in the Torah that to be sad. And there's no mitzvah to be happy. Right? In the Torah we're talking about. But what sadness will do to you, no sin in the world will do. And what joy and happiness will do to you, no mitzvah will do. So I have to understand that everything in my life is good. When I understand that everything in my life is good, then I'm always happy. Then I serve Hashem. Everything is with true happiness. Because I see positive in everything. Doesn't matter what happens. Now, of course, this is not something that turns overnight. You have now Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Shabbat. You have a few days to prepare for Shavuot. The two things that we need to do, I told you, stay up and we read the Tikkun. The Tikkun Lel Shavuot is a, as a, a composition of all the 24 books of the Torah, a few chapters, a few verses of the beginning of the end of each chapter and each parasha. It takes a few hours to read it. I highly recommend to do it. Why? Because that's connecting you to the Torah. Later on, the next thing you need to do is you need to hear the Ten Commandments. It doesn't matter if, you, if you're up all night and you pray at 5 o'clock in the morning, good. If you're not, then wake up in the morning. I'm sure you'll find the minyan at 12 o'clock in the afternoon where you hear the Ten Commandments. Why? In the Ten Commandments in the Torah, there are 613 letters corresponding to the 613 mitzvot, corresponding to the 613 limbs, bones, tendons, and organs in our body. And by hearing the Ten Commandments, I am connected to the essence of the Torah. So practically what you want to do, A, you stay up all night. You asked before if women stay up all night. If you can, then you stay up all night. But you don't schmooze outside with the friends and gossip about the entire town. You read the Tikkun. You can read the Tikkun, then read Tehillim. You can read Tehillim, then read the Chumash. But learn Torah. It's hard for you to stay up all night? No problem. Go to sleep at 9. Wake up at 12. Stay up for 4 hours till 4 o'clock in the morning. Till a lot of shahar, till dawn. The meal is still going on at 11 or 12. Okay, uh, listen, I'm, uh, I'm not, I can't give you advice for everything. I'm, so take a nap during Shabbat. 
or do the meal at 9 and sleep until at 10 and sleep from 10 to 12. Listen, I can't come with all the solutions. Uh, you have to be creative. You know, I tell a lot of people, Shabbat, sleep in the afternoon. Sleep for four or five hours in the afternoon. Get a good schnuff. And again, I told you, I can't come with all the solutions. I'm just telling you, if you can't, then, then be up at least a fraction of the night. If it's very difficult to you, then be up from one to four. Because one is closer to Chatzot and four o'clock already is done. If you can stay up and pray with the minyan, go ahead. They'll be all, uh, all around. You'll find minyanim at four o'clock in the morning. I mean, I told this to be called the but they put the talit on and say, net starts at quarter to five, but say 20 to five. Again, listen, every person can do whatever they can. The ultimate is that you stay up all night, you learn Torah, you know, stay up and schmoozing. Now, many people ask, I can read the tikkun, but there's going to be an online, on all night learning in uh, shul. Good, that's learning Torah. You need to learn Torah. The ultimate is to read the tikkun. And then, of course, to pray, uh, if you can, pray with a minyan and to listen to the Ten Commandments. So, you know, let me say it the other way. The ultimate is you stay up all night, you read the tikkun, and then you pray early in the morning and you hear the Ten Commandments, seven o'clock in the morning, go to sleep. You cannot do that, then the, do the minimum, the minimum. You can be up all night for three hours and then go back to sleep and then wake up to do a late minyan, fine. But make sure that you, and listen, if you can't stay up all night for whatever reason, I can't think why a person will not be able to stay up all night unless they're extremely sick, extremely weak, very old, or I can't think of anything else. If I would tell you I'm giving you in the morning a $5 million check, you would be dancing all night. So it's all matters of priorities. I told you, I know many people, when it goes, when it goes to a club, they're up all night. To sit in front of the book, so it's all matters of priorities. If you understand the prize that you can connect to Sfirat Keter and get all this Shefa and clean all the pipes and sweeten all the judgments and all these great things, you'll stay up all night. You'll find all the ways to stay up all night. Take a nap from 4 o'clock in the afternoon to 7 in the evening on Shabbat. Do whatever you can. Now really between us, if you're healthy, what's the big deal to stay up all night? It's not such a big deal. Just eat a good meal. Don't eat a heavy meal that you're like, oh. Some people stay up all night with coffee. Some people stay up all night with the dried fruit from all the sugar in it. Do whatever you need to do. What's the big deal? We're telling you one night a year to stay up all night, to connect to Hashem, to enliven your neshama, to connect to the Torah, to rejuvenate your, your soul, to clean all the dirty pipes. What am I asking? I'm giving you here millions of dollars worth of uh, prizes. So you stay up all night. Pray in the morning, what's the big deal? And again, for the ones who it's very hard for them, again, I'm not being judgmental to anybody, I know the Yetzirah is going to come and drive you crazy and make you fall asleep. The Yetzirah is perfect with putting you to sleep. All year round, you're up all night watching series on Netflix. On Shavuot, you fall asleep. But I'm just telling you what you need to do. So just uh, very quickly to recap, I told you the three things. Take a look what you're showing me. Three things is that you need to... Uh, uh, accept the yoke of Shamaim that is the master of the universe, like I said before. Total unity in Avat Israel and Avot Hashem Besimcha. That is something that you really have to prepare and internalize and find all the loopholes how to do it yourself. And like I told you, you read the ten, the uh, the Tikkun Lel Shavuot and the uh, uh, hearing of the Ten Commandments. But besides the physical things, what you want to do. Spiritually, you have to understand that this is a very powerful night. And the whole day is powerful. You already set up your, uh, your schedule, what you want to do. I'm just giving you the information. It's one of the most, if not the most powerful nights of the year. The preparation makes a big difference. Don't worry about right now the cheesecake or your, or your, or your snooze, uh, you're sleeping. Worry about what am I doing that night? It's a once in a year opportunity. How am I coming to this day? It's hard for you to stay up all night. So start preparing of accepting the yoke of Shamayim and applying the Avat Israel and accepting that everything is good. This is Avodah. What do you think? You're going to get the, 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 the prize of all the jackpot without doing any work? That's Avodah. It has to be preparation. It has to be work here. But you're investing for the rest of the year. You're cleansing yourself, rejuvenating yourself, connecting yourself to your source. What more do you want? You know, we all suffer from different things. 
whether it's health issues, financial issues, marital issues, everybody has issues. You're not the only one. We all have a lot of struggles. Here we have an opportunity to clean all the, the pipes. New beginning, shefa, new energy comes down. You're getting connected to the source. So first, what was important to me is more to explain to you what happens that night, not to give you uh, tips how to stay up and when to eat the cheesecake. That you decide what you want to do. I want to give you what the, the teachings of Kabbalah tells you that special night. Now, you know, if I would tell you that Friday evening or Saturday afternoon, you'd be like, well, now you're telling me. So I'm telling you now. So you have two, three days to digest it, to prepare, to say to yourself, okay, how am I accepting the yoke of Shem? How am I accepting that the Shem is the master? Okay, I need to do A, B, and C. These are my stumbling blocks. These are the things that are stopping me from really accepting that Hashem is in charge. Okay, you wrote that. Check. How do I really do Avat Yisrael? Okay, okay, that's a little bit of a challenge, but I'll do A, B, and C. I'll be less judgmental. I'll be less jealous. I'll be more accepting, etc., etc. How do I become Besimcha? Then I gave you a lot of uh, uh, advice how you become really Besimcha. And the main thing is that you just accept that everything that Hashem does to you in your life is good. Then uh, that, there, there it is. You're always Besimcha. And to read the Tikkun, I can tell you already that the first night of Shavuot that I celebrated 20 plus years ago when I became observant, you know how long it took me to read the Tikkun? Two months. I started reading it that night. Of course, I fell asleep drooling on the table the whole night. But then I read it throughout the day and I was, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't read. So I read here minute, five minutes, there five minutes. For two months, every day I read a few pages. I said, I'm going to finish this Tikkun even if it's in Sukkot. But I'm finishing it. It's thick. It's a thick book. Now, if you do it fast, two, three hours, you can knock it out. I see, I see people do it in two hours. If you're reading slow, four hours. Their first holiday of Shavuot, I'm telling you, two months it took me to, I said, I will die, but I'm finishing this tikkun. So, but nevertheless, I, I put it to the, to the that was the, the goal. With the years, it came. It took me the whole day. And then slowly, slowly, it got to a point that I'm able to read it before dawn. That's also a big thing. Even last year, people were asking questions. We had classes. I couldn't finish it before dawn. I reached almost to the end. And the rest I had to do in the afternoon. That was, I, I actually was annoyed. I was like, I wanted to finish the tikkun. I want to come to go dawn. I finish the tikkun. Go to the mikveh and pray shacharit. So listen, you do what you can. You do whatever you can, but if you can do the Yikun, then the minimum of the minimum. You want to learn Torah a little bit. You can do all night. Do one hour. Make an effort. Put your alarm clock to wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning. We'll learn one hour. Go back to sleep. That you can grab the Limud Torah, the learning at night. You're saying, that's way too hard for me. Then I tell you what, finish your meal at 10. 10.30, go to sleep, wake up at 4.30 in the morning so you can learn half an hour Torah and attach yourself to some minyan. Here, Kriyat Torah in Nets. What about Ruth? Megillat Ruth? That, the Megillat Ruth, you, not everybody has that custom. That you can read uh, after the Shacharit. That's different customs. That's why I'm not uh, necessarily, not everybody reads Megillat Ruth. Some people read it before Shacharit, after Shacharit, in the afternoon. If you can, listen, I can give you now homework for, to, to keep you occupied the whole Shavuot. We're talking about the basics here. More important to me right now that you internalize what's happening that night. That you're not going to pass the night of Shavuot and be like, what an opportunity I missed. Now I have to wait till Sukkot, till Rosh Hashanah. And I know a lot of people saying, I don't like the approach because I can turn to Hashem at any given moment. You're right. You can repent any moment you want. You can actually reach to the exact same thing in any day. But it's going to be much harder. Shavuot is an express lane. How do you call it? The HOV lanes. You're just flying on the lane. High occupancy, right? So Shavuot is an express lane. Why now? Of course you can do it every day. You can do tshuva. You can connect to Hashem at any given moment. But here am I having a, an express ticket. Free pass. And then you take a good use of it. It's a very, very powerful night. That's the night that Hashem decided to give us the Torah. Can you imagine what happened to the world when Hashem decided to bring the Torah down from the world above to the world below? The whole world changed in the giving of the Torah. Just imagine up until then how the world was. The world was without Torah. Can you imagine what chaos? The Torah is a present for the entire world. And that's the night. That's the birthday of the giving of the Torah. So internalize everything that we just learned. 
understand that the, everything that we learn now, besides the Shavuot, if you put that as your foundation to your existence, you're going to be a much different person. When you're applying everything that I just told you now, with accepting the Creator to the world, with having unbelievable and unconditional love to any individual, accepting that everything is good, living in a state of simcha, you're a total different individual. Not only on Shavuot, you're a total life. You, you, you are you on steroids, spiritual steroids. You are you, the best version of you. And this is your jumping board. So it's a powerful night. You can really take that night and jump forward, gain a lot, learn a lot, do a lot. And then, of course, the ultimate blessing, that the same way that Hashem blessed us that night with receiving the Torah, then we're receiving the Torah again. As Allah Hashem, we should all merit to see the same uh, action as it was then in Mahar Sinai very soon. When Mashiach is going to come, a new Torah is going to be given. It's not a real new, it's more just we learn much more in depth to it. But nevertheless, this should uh, open all of our channels to be blessed with great health with great wisdom, with love to Hashem, with love to the Torah, love to people, that we should find our purpose in this world and in this lifetime and always see the good in everything so we can benefit from that and become the true person that I need to become and be a, a great contributor to this entire world and do my part by owning my share of my Torah, but sharing it with the entire world. And Bezal Hashem, all the blessings that we should, should that we are receiving, that should be revealed, and that we should actually see the blessing in our life. And needless to say, be appreciated and thankful to Hashem. So all that's left is to wish you Chag Sameach and uh, a good Yom Tov. And Bezal Hashem, all your wishes should be fulfilled, and we should really take that uh, opportunity to change the world and flood the world with good and kindness and the light of the Torah. And, uh, and internalize everything that we just learned and really benefit from it.